We trying to figure out a way to explain to all of our family and friends exactly what it was like to attend the Center for Cartoon Studies. And if you saw the documentary last night, maybe that gives you a bit of an idea, but uh, this is not like any other school. And any time I've ever tried to convey the experience to someone, I end up just listing things that happened that you should have been to, or using convoluted Lord of the Rings metaphors. <laughs> um, but you're at a cartoon college commencement, so uh, I guess you can expect some Lord of the Rings because it's super sweet. <laughs> um, it was similarly difficult for most of us to explain to our loved ones that it was very important we drop everything, move to a valley in Vermont you've never heard of, and spend all of our time, money, and energy putting little pictures and words into boxes. Admitting to the world that you want to attend Cartoon College is, it seems like such a cute thing to say, like when a little kid comes up to you and says, when I grow up, I'm going to be a spaceship. <laughs> but most of us lost a lot of sleep over this decision, uh, trying to justify and rationalize it, not just to our family and friends, but to ourselves. It's a bit of a crazy thing to want to do in some ways. And some of our loved ones understood right away. They said, of course, you have to go. Some were skeptical, and maybe some still are. Uh, maybe some of them were afraid for us. I'm afraid to have kids of my own now, uh, not because I'm worried about money or the future, but, uh, you know, we're resourceful. We're going to be fine. Uh, but I'm afraid because one day I'm going to have to look them in their little faces and tell them, out of all the things I've done with my life, you're the second best. <laughs> So I'm going to try to see if I can explain why this experience is so great. Um, first of all, the program itself was designed to challenge us, challenge us and push, push us past our limits. When I was little, I went to elementary school with this kid who only drew big, beefy, muscly arms. Over and over and over and over. Nothing else, just disembodied arms flexing on every page of his notebook. And they were really good arms, but I could never help but wonder what would happen if he tried drawing some other things. And this is a little bit how uh, the way CCS works. Uh, the boot camp of the first semester takes everything you're comfortable with and strips it away and builds you back up with assignment after assignment after assignment. And yet no faculty member would ever tell you that just drawing muscly arms is dumb or a waste of time. Instead, they would uh, equip you with knowledge and tools and uh, encourage you to make the best stories possible featuring disembodied arms. <laughs> So I want to talk about the faculty a little bit. Uh, I've had some really great teachers in my life, including a uh, substitute teacher who showed up with a garbage bag of popcorn one day. Uh, but the faculty at CCS is something else entirely. Their professional and personal lives are laid bare in front of us in every class. We see not only the highs and lows of their careers, but we also get to be part of their lives. When their kids get sick, or a client is driving them crazy, or they're having a difficult drawing day, we feel it too. We're not just reading about long-dead artists in history books, we're seeing our heroes live the life in front of us every day. And it makes it seem possible and attainable. How can we ever give ourselves an excuse not to work when we see Alec Longstreth and John Chad busting their asses every day? Uh, how can we not stand up for our creative rights with Steve Bissett sticking up for creators every day? How can we not want to aspire to telling the best stories possible with J Jason Lutz blowing our minds with every lecture? It uh, makes me think of something James Sturm said to us last year, which thankfully I can repeat in public. <laughs> uh, he said, even stranded on a desert island, I'm going to find a stick and draw on the sand. That really stuck with me. So all the justifying and rationalizing that went into the decision to commit our lives to cartooning seems kind of unnecessary now, because we're surrounded by people at all levels and abilities who are trying to make this thing work too. Steve Bissett told us on the first day of class that we would make some lifelong connections here, and I thought I knew what he meant at the time, but it turns out that knowing something and living it are two really different things. The cartoonists you see on stage went from strangers awkwardly exchanging small talk on the first day of class to a group of people I don't think any of us can imagine our lives without now. I can't tell you how hard cartooning can be, but it feels so much easier when you know you have other people you can talk to about it who are sitting at their desks and making it work too. After countless late nights in the studio and lab, chili cook-offs, costume parties, movie nights, board game nights, swimming in the river, conversations over beverages, and I guess I'm just listing things that you should have been to again. <laughs> the truth is, whenever I try to explain what this experience was like, I'm always reminded of a scene from the third Lord of the Rings movie. 
In the scene I'm thinking of, the hobbits have returned from their grand adventure. And they're in a crowded pub, and they're very small among the sort of noise and hustle and bustle of the room. And they don't say anything to each other. They just exchange these meaningful looks. They know that everyone else's lives have been going on as normal, and that everyone is unaware of uh, everything the travelers have seen and done. The hobbits know that even if they tried to describe the horror and the beauty that they've seen, it wouldn't mean the same thing to anyone else. So to everyone in the CCS community, thank you for sharing the horror and the beauty of cartooning. <laughs> I can't really explain with words what this was or what it meant, but I look forward to whatever we do next. Thank you. While I'm up here, I'd like to invite uh, my classmate, Dave Weiner. So, uh, we're all here today to celebrate our class's graduation from the Center for Cartoon Studies. But there's someone else here today, aside from the members of the class of 2012, who, in a sense, is also graduating from CCS. Alec Longstreth has been making comics for all of his adult life. In 2008, he was asked to come to CCS to do a fellowship, and he's been teaching at CCS ever since. Every CCS student in this room, and all, almost every past generation of CCS students, has in some way benefited from Alec's instruction. At various times, he's taught us writing, drawing, lettering, professional practices, and comics history, and more about InDesign, composition, uh, design composition, and the Adobe Creative Suite programs than we ever expected to learn, or maybe wanted to. <laughs> uh, we've been lucky to have Alec as a teacher and a friend, and he's done a fantastic job this year as acting director of the school. So it's with happiness for Alec, but sadness for future generations of CCS, that we tell you Alec is moving on. One of the rites of passage for every student that has attended CCS since 2008 is Alec's famous lecture, Your Comics Will Love You Back. More than any other moment, this is the point in a CCS student's time at the school at which, the, at which a member of the faculty transmits directly to the student all of the love, passion, and commitment that he has for this medium. Like all of the faculty and students at CCS, Alec is a storyteller, and when he delivers his Comics Will Love You Back talk, Alec becomes for each of us a character in one of the stories that has been most important to Alec in his own life. He becomes CCS's very own Obi-Wan Kenobi. <laughs> In his story, Alec is Luke Skywalker, trying to figure out where he came from and why, as well as where he has to go and how he's going to get there. But for all of us little Lukes here at CCS, <laughs> he's undoubtedly been our Obi-Wan Kenobi, our wise and mysterious spiritual master, telling us that we are capable of anything to which we set our minds, that we must trust ourselves and our instincts, and that if we are ever struck down, we will, as cartoonists, become more powerful than you can possibly imagine. <laughs> Alec will forever be a CCS legend for one other special lecture that he gives to all first-year students. It's about one of his personal heroes and one of the true heroes of cartooning, Karl Barks, one of the greatest artists to ever practice in this medium. Barks is famous for his comics about Disney's Uncle Scrooge character. So the class of 2012 are sending Alec off into the world beyond with a special gift from us to him. We picked out a spread from Barks' Uncle Scrooge comics, and each of us drew and lettered one panel in the spread in our own respective style. <laughs> then we put it back together as a spread commemorating what Alex done for us by reimagining a page by one of Alex's heroes as a page of the class of 2012. In the last panel, oh, excuse me, in the last panel of this spread, Scrooge's nephews Huey, Dewey, and Louie tell Scrooge, we don't know Uncle Scrooge, but we're sure that in these changing days, you can never guess what will be along tomorrow. And that, along with a simple and heartfelt thank you, is what we want to say to Alec today. to say a special thank you to Valerie Fleischer and Michelle Ali for helping us make this possible. Thanks, wow. 
Um, all right. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm James Durham. I'm the, the director of um, the Center for Cartoon Studies. And um, this is, I guess, the last time I'll address uh, this class of 2012. So um, first and foremost, uh, congratulations. Uh, you've worked so much, so hard. And I know I speak uh, for all the faculty and staff when I say thank you for being so awesome. Uh, I know the faculty and the staff put so much uh, into trying to make this experience um, special. And when it's met by your passion and energy, um, it's just so satisfying. Um, you're graduating. Uh, from here on in, things aren't going to be as clearly focused. The first year out of school can be a bit rough, uh, a little scary. Serious transitions await you. Uh, a lot of you are moving away, most of you. You will need to find work, pay back loans. Maybe some of you move in with your parents. Uh, as I said, some pretty scary stuff lies <laughs> uh, For both the parents, of course. <laughs> um, so I was trying to kind of focus my remarks about, you know, maybe something to get you through this next year of, of transitions. Uh, so I reached out uh, to a few years, a uh, uh, few of the graduates from last year who recently graduated and uh, who had been in the real world for a year, and uh, I asked them if they had any advice to pass along to you uh, for the first year at a cartoon school, and uh, here's what they said. Um, Pat Barrett, uh, now living in New York, had this to say. Start by taking a month or two off from making comics. Spend that time taking in as much as you can so you have stores of insight, information, and fresh inspiration when you get back to it. And just because you don't finish a 120-page graphic novel every three months doesn't mean you're a fraud or a failure. The most important thing is to keep, uh, keep producing, but at a sustainable pace. Uh, Beth Hetland, now living in Chicago, said this. Is Beth here? Hi. Oh, yeah. hey, Beth, I should, I should just have you read this. Uh, so Beth Hetland in Chicago, now in White River Junction. <laughs> Whatever you do, don't stop making work. If you need to create deadlines, use conventions. If you need to be held accountable, find an accountability buddy. It's a good word. <laughs> Most of all, find a cheap place to print your work. From Nomi Kane, out in uh, Berkeley or Oakland right now, make as much art from as many sources uh, as you can. I've done everything from wedding invitations to a logo to a group of traveling nurses this year, and as silly or as trivial, trivial as some of it has seemed, seemed it all, it's all stuff that's led me to more work. And work drawing is more satisfying than work not drawing, no matter what it is. Very true. And finally, these are words from Josh Kramer, Kramer, who's in Washington, D.C. now. Stay in touch. I never thought I would actually use Google Hangout, but social media can sometimes reasonably fake the feeling that friends are close by. Do what you can to make the rent or whatever, but be proud of your degree and call yourself a cartoonist when someone asks you what you do. Your friends and family know you went to school for comics. Now inform them that the fruits of your labor are ready and that your site takes PayPal. <laughs> uh, I suppose my parting words uh, to all of you is that you got into CCS because you showed promise. You're graduating because you fulfilled that promise. In the years ahead, I can't wait to see what comes out of your inkwell or electronic inkwell or however you project on your mind into some <laughs> collective screen that we're all looking at. So I just ask you guys to, to stay in touch, show us what you're working on, and you're always welcome. In, in and thank you again. As, as many as our, our friends, uh, as many as our, our graduates know, and uh, as many as their families and friends know, uh, cartoonists are, are odd. Uh, they are driven in ways uh, that most normal folks wouldn't understand. Had they gone to prep school with Mitt Romney, you might have been beaten up by him. <laughs> now, now as, as, as strange as a career choice as, as, as being a cartoonist might seem, it's part of a larger history. And today's commencement speaker takes that history and transforms, its, it, 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 it transforms it into moving and memorable novels. The characters and stories of, of, of his books, like Funny Papers and Dugan Underground, are too colorful and compelling to be not... Uh, to not be based on real people in history. Publishers Weekly on uh, Derby Dugan's Depression Are Funny said, and I quote, beneath the raffish surface charm of DeHaven's comic strip like novel is a potent meditation on death, violence, broken hearts, friendships betrayed, and life's other inconveniences, end quote. 
Among cartoonists, our commencement speaker is revered for his brilliant writing, his passion for cartooning, and making us cartoonists feel, as we toll away in our studios, connected to an electric, crazy, profound tradition. Please welcome Tom DeHaven. Thank you all. Thank you, James, distinguished faculty, parents and friends of the graduates, and especially to the class of 2012. I'm honored to be here today, but it's crossed my mind that many of you, maybe all of you, might have felt a little, shall we say, crushed when you heard who your commencement speaker would be. <laughs> a few years ago, I read that Kermit the Frog was the commencement speaker at a major American university, and that a number of students were pretty disgruntled about it. I spent a hundred thousand bucks in four years of my life, and I get talked to by a sock. <laughs> I'm not quite a sock, but I'm not a cartoonist either. And you're well within your rights to wonder how damn presumptuous I'll get trying to give you all some pearls of wisdom. I'm a novelist, but you, you lucky dogs, are practitioners of the great American art. I'm a guy who deals in words. I put them down, I move them around. You, on the other hand, deal in words and pictures. You're the lineal descendants of giants like Elsie Seagar and Marjorie Henderson Buell, Harold Gray, Charles Schultz, Tarpe Mills, John Stanley, George Herman, and the colleagues and living, ma living masters like Robert Crumb, and Alison Bechtel, Dan Clowes, Jessica Abel, Phoebe Glockner, as well as those who've been your teachers and mentors for the past couple of years. But let's see if I can make a little case for myself as an appropriate guest speaker. And I think the simplest way of doing that is to say this. Since the age of seven, and I just, God help me, turned 63 last week. Since the age of seven, in my heart of hearts, I've always been a cartoonist. My heroes, my greatest heroes and inspirations have always been cartoonists. It's why I spent well over 20 years researching the lives and the careers and the profession of American newspaper, comic book, and underground cartoonists to write about them in three novels. I look at you today, you proud, talented graduates, and I'm filled with both delight and unbecoming jealousy. I love your calling. I admire, appreciate, and need what you create. And I think, oh, if only, if only there had been a CCS back when I needed it. As a young comics crazed boy, and then later as a comics crazed adolescent, I drew my own strips. I never had any training. I went to a Catholic parochial school in the 1950s, and then a Catholic high school in the 1960s, and there was no art instruction, none, nada. All I had were the daily comics in the newspaper and my weekly pile of 10 cent and later 12 cent comic books. So to learn how to draw, I copied. I copied from Chester Gould and Milton Kniff, Erwin Hazen, Wilson McCoy, Roy Crane, Bill Overgaard, Leslie Turner, Zach Mosley, Ramona Fraden, Gil Kane, Carmine Infantino, and of course Jack Kirby. My first comic strip character, which I created when I was eight or nine, was named, and remember, this was the 1950s, Bebop McCarthy. <laughs> <laughs> the actual title of my strip was Bebop McCarthy House Detective. <laughs> I must have heard the term house detective somewhere, and my young brain just assumed that a house detective was somebody who went door to door like an encyclopedia salesman looking for crimes to solve. Good afternoon, madam. Are there any bandits or counterfeiters living here that you'd like me to remove? By the age of 10 or 11, I discovered in an art supply store a bunch of oversized books on how to draw cartoons. That was how I learned about such wondrous things as two-ply Bristol board brushes, art gum erasers, India ink, and the most amazing piece of equipment of all, pen nibs. God, I love buying and experimenting with pen nibs. Except for introducing me to the tools of the trade, the books themselves were eminently unhelpful. Maybe when you started out, you used some of those books yourselves. Uh, so you know what I mean. There'd be a lesson called something like drawing people. And figure one would consist of one long vertical and slightly parabolic line bisected by a shorter horizontal parabola. 
Okay, I can do that. <laughs> Figure two consisted of those same two lines with the addition of one oval at the top, a larger oval below that, and then two long skinny tubes at the bottom. Okay, got it. But then, always, every damn time, figure three would show a completely finished human being. <laughs> always male, with a fully realized head, arms, hands, fingers, feet, toes, the whole McGill. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Now just how is somebody supposed to make the leap from those two lines, two ovals, and two tubes into that? I needed 25 incremental figures, and I only got those lousy three. I needed more, I needed teachers. I needed a school, but there were no schools that I knew about. How did my favorite cartoonists learn to draw? How did they get their chops? I needed the answer. So being a follow-through kind of guy, at least in my youth, I went to the Bayonne, New Jersey Public Library and found everything I could find about cartooning and cartoonists. Today, of course, in the holdings in your Schultz Library are proof of this. There are vast numbers of books about cartooning and cartoonists, but in those days there were very few. Stephen Becker's Comic Art in America, Colton Wu's The Comics, Martin Sheridan's Comics and Their Creators. Those were the first books I got and I checked them out again and again and that's when I fell in love with the romance of cartooning. And it is a romantic profession no matter what Dan Clough says. <laughs> it was in those books that I learned how most cartoonists up till then had learned their craft. Either they were fortunate enough to grow up in the same neighborhood where a famous cartoonist lived and they just hung around and made themselves useful, absorbing everything, the way Bud Sagendorf did it, apprenticing with Elsie Seagar, or else, and this was by far the more prevalent route, they took mail or home study courses. The two earliest of those schools of cartooning were the Charles N. Landon School and the W. L. Evans School, both of them based in Cleveland, Ohio. It's amazing how many of the great and famous 20th century cartoonists learned their craft not only how to draw, but how to draw for reproduction from one or other of those courses. Chester Gould, Elsie Seagar, Hank Ketchum, and Bill Molden, to name only a few, subscribed to the Evans course. Carl Barks, Floyd Gothardson, Roy Crane, Milton Kniff, Jack Cole, V.T. Hamlin, and Chip Young, again naming just a few, subscribed to the Landon course. You could buy the course books for about eight bucks, but if you wanted your work corrected by Evans or Landon themselves, that would cost you an extra 20 to 25 bucks. I don't know exactly what the Center for Cartoon Studies charges, but I figure allowing for changing times that it's a little bit more. <laughs> the Landon and Evans schools were both long gone by the time I was in need of instruction, but others similar to them existed in the 1950s and 60s, the best known being the famous artist school of Westport, Connecticut. It was founded in 1948 by illustrators Albert Dorn and Norman Rockwell and originally cost $300 for the complete set of lessons. Full page ads for the famous artist schools which offered courses in illustration and painting as well as in cartooning appeared in popular magazines around the time I got super serious about a cartooning career. For aspirants like me, the famous cartoonist course was a sine non qua of professional instruction. In the 1990s, when Art Spiegelman and Francoise Moulet, who'd been married by then for decades, decided to get married again publicly and throw a big party with Robert Crumb's band supplying the music, Francoise had this brilliant idea to get the best ever present for her husband, and she found a pristine set of the original famous artist course in their magnificent bright yellow oversized binders. When she gave it to him after the wedding, I was green. Green, I tell you, with jealousy. When I spoke with Art a few weeks later, I told him about that bitter, galling jealousy, and he said, yeah, he could understand that. But, but, Francoise hadn't realized there were three separate courses, and she'd ended up giving him the illustration course. Ever since then, I thought, jeez, imagine how great a cartoonist Artie would be today if only Francoise had bought the right course. <laughs> The lessons of the famous cartoonist school were written by, or ostensibly written by, such luminaries as Al Cap, Milt Kniff, Ruth Goldberg, Willard Mullins, Whitney Darrow, Jr. Of course, I sent away for the informational material, but the cost was prohibitive. My mother worked in a bank and brought home less than $45 a week. It was a crushing blow, although, and this was such an amazing thing, for which I'm still grateful, my mother looked around on her own and found a far less expensive course uh, a home study course, the Washington School of Art out of Port Washington, New York. 
and she signed me up for it. Twelve booklets and an impressive to me box of supplies consisting of two pencils, one brush, one pen staff with three different nibs, a fabulous soft blue eraser, a few charcoal sticks, a Conte crayon, and a T-square. I took that course, imperfect as it was, and I wish I still had all of my returned artwork with their taped over see-through overlays with corrections made in red pencil. Unfortunately for me, only two of the lessons pertain specifically to making comics, but even so, it was real instruction, and there were real teachers telling me what I'd done right and what I'd done wrong and how to correct it. It seemed incredible to me, though, back in my adolescence but well into my adulthood, that there weren't real brick-and-mortar schools that taught cartooning, that had a living, breathing, talking, hectoring faculty of teachers. <laughs> actual practitioners to train students about the tools, strategies, and mindset of this astonishing profession. If things had been different 40 years ago, I might not be standing here talking to you as a visiting civilian. I might very well be sitting over there with James Stern, Jason Lutz, Bob Sikoyak, Alec Longstreth, and the legendary Steve Bissett. Mentioning Steve reminds me of this. After I'd given up on my dream of being an actual working cartoonist and gone on to write my first novel, and long after I'd abandoned hope of there ever being such a thing as a genuine school of cartooning, I learned about the Cuba School in Dover, New Jersey. New Jersey, my beloved home state. When it opened in 1976, I was 27 and hadn't drawn comics in over five years. Even so, I toyed with the idea of applying, but not too late. Yet even though it was too late for me, I still was fascinated by the reality of such a place. In those days, it was known as the Joe Kubert School of Cartooning and Graphic Art. And in those days, too, I wrote regularly for a magazine called New Jersey Monthly. So naturally, I pitched an article in the Kubert School. Finally, I was given the go-ahead, and with my wife and infant daughter in tow, we drove from Jersey City to Dover and met with Joe and Muriel Kubert. We have a photograph of my baby daughter, Jessie, who is 33 today, being held by a wide, smiling Muriel, one of the nicest and kindest of women. They took us around the original school, which was a big old mansion. I dropped into several studios and just stood there watching. I vividly remember seeing sporty Irwin Hazen deliver a lecture, watching, taking notes, and thinking all the while, this is so cool, but also thinking, damn. <laughs> and as you know, your uh, instructor, uh, Steve Bissett was the first graduate in class at the Cuba School. You graduates are so fortunate that James Stern and Michelle Holly founded this school in 2004. What I dreamed about in the early 1960s is a reality here, a bona fide school with a bona fide professional faculty focus on just one thing, making comics. When I first came to White River Junction in 2009, I was stunned. Not only was this town like a Dylan Horrocks comic book come to life, <laughs> young cartoonists swarming all over the place, it was as though an adolescent of fantasy of mine, one of the non-sexual ones, had sprung to life <laughs> 40 years later. Uh, CCS is not only a cool place to learn your craft, it's also one of the most serious, demanding, and inspiring places I've ever been. That you finished the course, that you're graduating from such a school that you've learned what you've learned and created the work you've made is profoundly impressive. And again, I'm green with jealousy. My grandmother was a locally beloved grammar school teacher, and when I was growing up, although she was long retired by then, scarcely a month went by that somebody in my house, my hometown, wouldn't come up to me on the street and say what a major impact she had on his or her life. So I grew up proud about that, and also somewhat in awe of teachers, good teachers. Yes, of course, cartoonists were the greatest people in the world, and astronauts weren't too shabby, and neither were homicide detectives, but teachers, <laughs> teachers were crucial, and if they were anything like my grandmother, magisterial. While I could pine to become a cartoonist and failing that an astronaut or a homicide detective, I could never imagine myself being a teacher. I was much too shy, too schlubby, too off in a corner somewhere. Well, you graduates know what I'm talking about. You were once kids who wanted to draw comics, you know the drill. We were pariahs and proud of it, yeah. <laughs> Strange thing is, though, I am a teacher now, a college professor, and have been for well over 30 years. And like your distinguished faculty, I teach what I practice. I teach fiction writing in an MFA program. How did that happen? How could I have gone from being unable to get out a single sentence in front of a group of people to earning my, the greatest part of my income from doing precisely that? Well, I think my grandmother is one of the reasons and enjoyment of my fiction career is another reason. 
But I also think that my terrible disappointment about not finding the cartooning teachers that I wanted and needed in my early life is one of the reasons, too. I've been taught the craft of fiction writing by teachers who learned it themselves and practiced it honestly and faithfully. Then I, in turn, went on to practice the profession to follow a calling, and it seemed natural and a great gift and a privilege to be able to pass on to others wherever it was I knew from training and experience. Which I'm glad to say neatly brings me to the wisdom, at least I hope it's the wisdom, part of my remark. And the first bit of it concerns teaching. Not all of you will have the opportunity or the desire to become professional teachers, but all of you will have the opportunity, and if I may say so, the moral obligation, to pass along to others some of what you learned here, now, elsewhere, later, about your art and your craft and your calling. Please don't be stingy. Be generous. Be as generous as your teachers have been here. About six years ago, I was teaching a huge college lecture course on the history of American comics. And I noticed this very scruffy looking guy I knew wasn't on the roster showing up for almost every class. I used to conduct office hours at a local coffee shop, and this young guy, who kept reminding me of Arthur Rambeau and Bob Dylan circa 1961, used to show up there to sit down and start asking me questions about old-timey cartoonists like Harold Gray or Chester Gould. He said, actually he kind of murmured or muttered, that he intended to be a cartoonist himself. And I got the distinct impression that he was intentionally leaving off the descriptive adjective that was on the tip of his tongue. And that adjective, I always thought, was great. He wanted to be a great cartoonist. Anyhow, my graduate teaching assistant and I finally said, bring us some of your work. We'd love to see it. And finally, he did. And I can remember the moment I opened his sketchbook. My eyes popped out of my head. Oh, God, this kid was good. We both told him, look, you've got to send this to a publisher. I kept saying, Kim Thompson, Kim Thompson, send this stuff to Kim Thompson, Panagraphic. Yeah, he said, he'd probably do that someday. About a year and a half later, I was in a comic shop and picked up what seemed to me the fattest graphic novel since From Hell. <clears throat> and in cartooning parlance, I nearly plopped when I saw the author's name. <clears throat> it was that scruffy Rambo Bob Dylan kid from my class, Dad Shaw. <laughs> maybe he'd sent his stuff to Kim Thompson because I'd suggested it, or maybe he'd already shown his stuff to Kim when I knew him and he was too shy or too ornery to tell me so. But I've always been delighted that Dash hung out in my class while he was in Rudgeman, and that I treated him well, encouraged him, and answered every question he'd asked me. Bought him a few cups of coffee. Always do that. Always find the time. Pass it on. And something else. Carefully nurture your career. Know what you want to do with your gifts and your training and go after it, but don't be afraid to take a detour or two or three. And know your profession. Know how it works, what's happening in it, who's happening in it. Be savvy, too. Savvy enough to know that once you start putting your work out to the world, you will be categorized immediately as a cartoonist who makes that kind of content. And be savvy enough to know that there will be a price you'll pay, often a steep one, if you suddenly surprise the world by doing another kind of content. Follow up your exquisitely nuanced childhood memoir with a run on Dial H for Hero, or vice versa, and you're going to be kicked right in the blogosphere. Don't be naive. You can't afford it. When I was a novice novelist, I read an essay by Harlan Ellison in which he urged young writers to write in all the genres, never stick to just one. And I thought that sounded wise. I took him up on it. My first novel was a contemporary fantasy, so I did a realistic crime novel for my second and a historical novel for my third, a young, adult, a young adult novel for my fourth. Then I did a book of novellas. I don't regret the trajectory of my career, but my decision came at a real economic and emotional cost. Reviewers and readers didn't know what to make of me. What kind of writer was I? To surprise and shape shift is often to confuse. And to confuse often is to be misunderstood, marginalized, and dismissed. I say this not in any way to suggest you follow one straight path during your career. I think that would be monstrously boring. But to urge you to always keep the realities and pitfalls of a professional career in mind. Do what you want to do, but always consider the ramifications of your choices. Otherwise, you'll turn into a bitter old guy like me. <laughs> By the way, I once spoke with O'Harlan Ellison and told him that I'd taken his career advice below those many years ago, and he laughed uproariously and said, why the hell did you listen to me? You're an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> a 
another piece of wisdom, or at least advice, is this. If somebody offers you interesting work, doing something that you've never done before, try as hard as you can not to admit it. You're a professional, and professionals can generally figure things out, given a little time and research. Someone called me up once and wanted to know if I'd be interested in writing scripts for an animated TV show. I said, sure I would. Then the guy said, are you familiar with television scripts? And I said, oh yeah, even though I'd never laid eyes on them. <laughs> but, but I knew how to write stories, so all I had to do was check out the format for scripts, and that was easy to do. I use the library, you can use the internet. I taught myself in a day or two all that I needed to know and ended up being a staff writer for the Adventures of the Galaxy Rangers. Great gig. And if I'd said no, I don't know anything about television script writing, the same thing would have happened that had happened a few years earlier when the film director Penny Marshall took me to lunch and asked me if I'd adapt one of my novels into a script for her. I said I'd love to, but I'd never written any scripts before. Maybe it would be a good idea to have a co-writer. She smiled, paid for our meal, and I never heard from her again. I'm not telling you to lie, mind you, just trust yourself. You have the chops, you have the smarts, which means you can stretch, which means you can do it. And finally this. All my life I've loved the word cartoonist because I know exactly what it means and I know what a cartoonist does. Lately though, I've noticed that the term is falling out of use and being replaced by the term comics artist, a situation that frankly gives me the shivers. <laughs> Among my graduate fiction students, I've become known for my impassioned mini-lectures, urging them never to call themselves artists, but instead to call themselves fiction writers, or short story writers, or novelists. That's what you are, I tell them, that's what you do. You may well be an artist, but it's always better to let other people call you that. Call yourself an artist, and you might be more inclined to talk about it than do it. Call yourself a writer, or to your graduates, a cartoonist, and you'll be more inclined more personally and professionally compelled to get up every day and go to your studio to work. And the work, try as it sounds, the challenge and the pleasure of the work, in doing the work, in making the work, of being present for and in the work is the only thing that matters. So to this impressive group of graduates, cartoonists, artists, my deepest congratulations and most sincere thanks, my sincere wishes for long, for satisfied, and truly remarkable careers in the greatest profession on earth. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Those were inspiring and memorable remarks. And Kermit the Frog is not the only one. <laughs> we, would, we would like to present you with this uh, certificate of appreciation for all of your, uh, all of your, all of your dedication. Thank you very much. Thank you. So at this time, we're going to confer degrees. But please ask all of the students to stand.
Dakota McFadden. Katie Moody. I'd also like to recognize our two fellows for this uh, academic 2012 year, Julie Delport. Center for Cartoon Studies and then follow us over to the exhibition opening. Congratulations.